Sunday and there's no need to be alone. Join us for Sunday at home. Hello. Welcome to Mount Hamilton Baptist Church. My name is Leanne Friesen. I'm the lead pastor here and I want to warmly welcome you today wherever you're watching from. If you call MHBC home, we're so glad that you can be together with your family today, wherever we may be watching from today. It is a blessing that we can keep gathering, even in this season for our people in Ontario of continued lockdown. It's a blessing that we have this ability to stay connected. And I hope that during this time of worship today, that you will worship, that you won't simply watch a video, but that you'll let this be a time that you can be present with God and with other Christians with you. I encourage you to uh, participate. You can comment, say hello, say where you're watching from. Take a moment during the service to message someone and greet them and say, we're glad you're here. If Mount Hamilton is not your home, and maybe this has been a time that you just sort of started finding us, maybe you don't usually attend church services, we're really glad you're here. And we pray that this will um, make you feel very welcome today. And we remind you that you can like, you can follow our page to continue to see what we're up to. And you can always reach out to our church. You can message us if you have questions and if you want to learn more. And that's true of all of you who call Mount Hamilton home. This is a hard time. We did not anticipate still being in this season in January. In fact, stepping back to this time. And so please, please remember that if you are struggling, if you need help, if you need support, to reach out to any of your pastors at any time, to reach out to someone from Mount Hamilton, you are not alone. We are in this together. God is with us and your church community, your church family is with you too. So I hope you'll remember that in a special way today. We also remind you that today you'll see Pastor Sam, our youth pastor, Pastor Les, our next generation pastor, Pastor Leslie's online moderating for us, and a huge thanks to Jacob Smith for uh, producing the service for us as we gather in this way. We're so thankful. As we come to worship today, we'll also join together in communion. We've gotten really good at doing communion like this. So that's a heads up that if at some point you need to go and get some bread or crackers or pizza or tortilla chips from your kitchen and something to drink, some juice. It doesn't have to be cranberry juice. It can be water. It can be whatever works for you to eat and drink and remember what Christ has done. And that will come up at the end of our service. As we come together today, let's take a moment to just uh, shift, right? Because as you're at home, uh, sometimes we don't have that transition of, you know, driving or walking to the church and then coming into the space and being like, yeah, we're in this new space. Take a moment to, to space transition in your head, so to speak. Maybe uh, you've had kids running around this morning. Maybe you've been rushing to get something to eat or you've been throwing the laundry on or maybe you just got out of bed. Maybe you're still in bed. To take that transition, I'm going to invite you to take one minute of silence. And I know that silence could be a little tricky. Maybe if your kids are little, you make that 10 seconds. You invite them to 10 seconds. And after that minute, I'm going to read us a psalm of praise before Sam leads us in singing as we worship together. Let's be quiet before God, during which time we can say, God, I am here to be present and to hear from you today.
Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nation are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Well, good morning. Uh, today, Leanne is going to be exploring the character uh, of God. And as we um, as we sing today, we've got a couple of songs that kind of do the same. Uh, I don't know how you um, deal with this time of singing at home. Sometimes it can be a little bit awkward uh, if you're maybe with a few other people to sing uh, too much. So if you're one of those people, I just want to encourage you to look through the lyrics of this song. Uh, look for um, characteristics of God and just reflect on those uh, as we sing. For those of you who love to sing, uh, feel free just to belt it out uh, as you would like to. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down worship him now how great how awesome is he and together we sing everyone sing holy is the lord god almighty the earth is filled with his glory holy is the lord god almighty the earth bow down and worship him now how great how awesome is he together we sing everyone sing holy is the lord god almighty the earth is filled with his glory and holy is the lord god
our love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only you give life you are love you bring light darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing praise are you lord all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing Lord, we just praise you for who you are. Thank you that you are holy, you are good, uh, you are loving, and we can trust that you will be all that and more. Amen. As we continue to worship today, one of the things that I believe is so important because we are a family as a church is to honor and name our losses and memories together. If you attend Mount Hamilton, you may have heard this week, we mentioned on email and on Facebook, that we lost a member of our church. He hadn't been able to attend for a number of years, uh, but he was a member here, he was baptized here. His name was Robert Moore. Uh, he came with other members of a group home that he lived in for adults with developmental disabilities and he brought so much joy to Mount Hamilton Baptist Church. One of the things that many of us will remember about Rob is that he liked to sing, sing, uh, may require some quotations, let's be honest. Uh, Rob just sang really loud and it was often not so much on pitch, but it was from his heart. He loved to worship and if he didn't know the words he couldn't read, he would just kind of hum real loud. There were sometimes I had to sort of maybe plug one ear a bit so I could follow the music myself if he was sitting near me. But I can honestly say that the sound of Rob worshiping has been and will remain one of my favorite experiences of worship because he praised God with his whole heart. Rob was so friendly. He always loved to chat and he mattered to us. Rob died this week from COVID and I think that one of the things that that also reminds us is that's exactly why we're doing this like this. We're not gathering in person. We're staying home for people like Rob, whose health was compromised. 
and who very sadly uh, lost his life to this terrible disease. Today we pause and we remember Rob. We're going to thank God for his life. And we're just gonna take a moment. Um, unfortunately, uh, we don't believe there's a service for Rob. A number of different situations is, uh, he didn't really have any family and so on. So this is our chance for us to remember Rob as his church family. And what we're gonna do is take a moment of quiet and we have a couple pictures of him for you to remember him. In that time, you can pray for those who loved him. Thank God for Rob's life, I'll do that. And then Sam's gonna lead us in a song. Here's what we're gonna do. He's gonna sing Amazing Grace. And Rob loved those traditional hymns because he knew the words. And so he loved the ones he knew the words to because then he could really sing them. So here's what we're gonna get you to do. Sam already acknowledged that singing at home can be strange, but some of you are on your own or you're with other people. As we listen to Amazing Grace, which we so often do at times that we remember uh, people who've passed away, I'm gonna invite you to sing along like Rob would sing as our tribute to him. And what I mean by that is you sing from your guts. You sing like you don't care if you're a bad singer. You sing like you don't care who's gonna hear you. You sing because you are giving it all to God. And so that's what Sam's gonna lead us in. And wherever you are, just belt it out in thanks and praise for God, for Rob's life and that he is now with his Lord. Let me pray before we take that moment to honor him. God, for Rob's life, we thank you. We thank you that we got to know him. We thank you for his joy. And we praise you today that he is singing with the heavenly chorus. May his life remind us of the joy we can have in worshiping you. Amen. Let's remember Rob. grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It was grace that tore
And now I want to invite the children uh, to go to Sunday school. Uh, you can find that link on our website. Uh, you can find it on the youth uh, Facebook page and I'll post it in the comments. Uh, also, you all, or you can go to uh, YouTube. We are also going to be exploring uh, the character of God and specifically the character of God as we go through storms. Thank you so much for that, Sam. I love that tribute. And you know, uh, you might wonder why uh, Jacob and I weren't singing. And you probably heard that with COVID, they only want only one person can sing in a space at a time. But when we've been when we were gathering in person, even with our restrictions, one thing though we were told was we could hum. So I took the chance to hum, and I found myself thinking how Rob modeled that to me. Didn't matter if I could sing the words, just hum if you don't know the words. And I look forward to singing along with Rob again someday. Um, now Sam was saying our, our sermons about the character of God, a little, little bit of a twist of that is today it, we're starting a series about theology, which is how we talk about the character of God. So we're talking about how we talk about God. And as we do that in this series, each week I'm going to invite people to tell us about why they chose to follow God. When I was growing up, we called this a testimony. And it's the person story of saying, here is my testimony of why I am a follower of Jesus. And today, Tara Smith is going to share her testimony. And we look forward to hearing that. Hi, everyone. My name is Tara Smith, and I have been attending Mount Hamilton Baptist Church since the fall of 2009. I came here as a McMaster Divinity College student doing a placement and ended up staying. This morning, Pastor Leanne asked me to share about my decision to follow Jesus and why that was the right choice for me. I come from a well-educated, middle-class family. My parents both graduated from university in Montreal in the mid-1960s. My mother was one of only three women to graduate from her home economics program. After my parents got married, they decided to move to Ontario to be further away from their families and to start careers in an English-speaking province. My father went on to do his MBA and worked in the business world. My parents also decided that they wanted to have a farm. So they bought a property, built a house, started farming all while working full time. After being married for 10 years, my parents decided to have children. I have two siblings, an older brother and a younger sister. My mom stayed at home to raise us while my father worked. Growing up, my parents encouraged us all to be the best people we could be. They wanted us to do well in school and to have balance in our lives. I played soccer and basketball and was part of the Girl Guide movement when I was growing up. I believed that girls could do whatever they wanted to. We also attended Sunday school on a semi-regular basis. The primary reason that we went is because my Nana wanted all her grandchildren to go to church. Therefore, I knew about God and Jesus, but I never understood that I could have a personal relationship with Christ. We didn't pray or read the Bible regularly at home. We said grace before meals on special occasions, but not every day. As teenagers, we stopped attending church on a regular basis. My parents didn't have the time to take us anymore, and we became Christmas and Easter churchgoers. As a result, during my early teenage years, I really didn't think much about God or what I had been taught as a child in Sunday school. However, my life changed drastically during the fall of my grade 12 year. And here's what happened. First, we moved from the farm where we had grown up into my small hometown. Next, I broke up with my high school boyfriend. Then my grandmother fell and broke her hip. She got a bad infection and she died in hospital. And then finally, in December, only a few weeks after uh, we had returned from burying my grandmother, my father left. He had been having an affair for over a year and decided that since his mother was dead, it was a good time for him to move and leave his family. I questioned whether I had done something wrong. I wondered why our family was no longer good enough for him. And instead of getting help from my friends or my family, I tuned them out. I told anyone who asked me that I was fine. 
On the outside, it probably did appear that I was fine, but I really wasn't. I didn't know how to deal with the hurt, the anger, the bitterness that I was feeling. I just sort of ignored all these feelings. A year after my father left my family, he moved to Australia, and once my parents' divorce was final, he remarried. I can tell you it was easier with him gone. I didn't have to see him or think about him on a regular basis. I dealt with a lot during my last two years of high school. I put on a great facade and convinced everyone that I was fine. I couldn't wait to finish high school and move out and go to university. I was ready for a fresh start. My dad leaving was a catalyst in my life. I had a friend who invited me to her youth group during my final two years of high school and another friend who invited me to go to church when I got to university. I went to see a counselor during my first year of university, which was very helpful. It was during the fall of my first year at university that I realized that I believed that Jesus was my savior and that I was ready to commit my entire life to him. Knowing Jesus, being discipled, and learning about forgiveness allowed me to reconcile with my father that same year. Colossians 3.13 says, Be gentle and ready to forgive. Never hold grudges. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. This has always been an important verse for me when I think about my father. It's not my place to judge him or condemn his actions. During my first year at university, I chose to forgive my father and reestablish a relationship with him, just as God has chosen to forgive me for the things I have done wrong. Once I made this decision, I felt as though a huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders. I went to Australia in the summer of 2000 to live with my father and my stepmother. While I was there, I was able to tell my father that I had forgiven him and had an opportunity to ask him questions about the decisions that he had made. I know for certain that I would not have been able to forgive my father for tearing our family apart without God in my life. Although we have reconciled and have a relationship, I can't say it's a great relationship. The distance makes it hard, uh, as does the fact that my father is aging. It is hard to know that he spends so much time with my stepsisters and their families in Australia when I only get a phone call every few months and I'm the one who has to organize it. Sometimes I have thought it would have been easier if my father had died. Because with the divorce and the decisions that my father has made, uh, we are often reliving so many things. There are still many times when I need to seek God and ask that bitterness not take root in my heart. It helps to remember that Jesus calls us to forgive others like we have been forgiven. Looking back now, over 20 years later, I can still say with absolute certainty that choosing to follow Jesus was the right decision for me. Thank you, Tara. That is a beautiful story about feeling that desire to follow God and seeing uh, that longing of your heart realized and God enabling you to see your life changed. We're so glad you're part of Mount Hamilton. Well, as I said, our series is about uh, the different ologies we study in our faith. And you may have seen the cover photo called, Oh, the Ologies. So as we think about different ologies, we're going to start with just a little game just to warm ourselves up. And what's going to happen is we're going to put up some slides and there's going to be three options and you can share your guess on what you think the ology is or just play along at home. Think about your answers, share with the people in your house, or you can share your answers online. Count how well you do. See how many of these you get right. So here is our first ology. What's the ology? Archaeology explores, is it A, fossils? B, past human activities, or C, arches. This one sounds like Okay, a Jacob's going to give his, give his answer. Jacob, what is your answer? I think it's past human activity. It is past human activity. Archaeology explores past human activity. In all fairness, fossils might some come into that in some ways, but archaeology is past human activity, and we give shout out to our favorite archaeologist, Indiana Jones. Okay. Cardiology explores, some of you will know this one closely, the heart, health, or greeting cards. I love your choice of greeting card here. Uh, it is but I go with the heart. The heart is the right answer. And so some of you have your cardiologist, don't you? Okay, here's the next one. 
Cosmology explores A, cows, B, the origin and laws of the universe, or C, stars. Let's give you a second, throw up your answers. So Jacob, what is your thought? As we journey across the cosmos, billions and billions <laughs> and billions, it's the universe. B, the origin and laws of the universe. Okay, gerontology explores, oh, and this is where our administrator has a good sense of humor, and it should be noted that I did age this week. So, uh, does gerontology explore germs, people named Gerald, or aging? I think you gave the answer away. Yeah, 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 Sorry. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, I'll let you know how our staff meeting goes mm. tomorrow. No, just kidding. That's <laughs> I think that picture is hilarious. That's good. And you're right. Gerontology explores aging. It's the study of aging. How about this one? Thanatology. Does thanatology study potatoes, comic book villains? Some of you will get the reference there. Or death and dying? What do you think, Jacob? I want it to be potatoes, but I think it's death and dying. Thanatology studies death and dying, so that's its own field. Um, how about this next one? Ichthyology. I'm, I don't know if that's how you say it. Ichthyology explores insects, things that are icky, or fish. What do you think, Jacob? As a kid who grew up with way too many fish tanks, it's fish. <laughs> it is fish. I thought insects might throw some of us. Jacob has like got a perfect score here. Okay, how about this one? Does numismatology explore numbers, things that make your hands go numb, or currency? This one, I don't think I know, and I think it has to deal with anesthesiology, so I'm going with hands going numb. No, this one wow. studies currency. Jacob, you were almost perfect. Oh, no. Numismatology studies currency. I cannot imagine how boring that would be. But maybe some of you will find that really, really interesting. And then our final one, theology explores the word the, all the other ologies, or God. What does theology explore, Jacob? Pastor Leanne, I'm proud to report that theology is about God, which is why we're here today. Yeah, well done, well done. I didn't even plan that. So how'd you do? I think there was eight all together. Whatever your score is just fine. That was a bit of fun. But as we said, today uh, we are thinking about theology. And I'm going to start by telling you three stories today. Three stories to me that all have something in common of things I have recently seen. This week on Facebook, I saw shared, and, and online in other places as well, a news article about a church in Kitchener that met last week and met in person, even though, of course, our restrictions in Ontario tell us not to, and that they faced and they got fined for meeting in person. I saw this article because a friend of mine commented on it, and it was her comment that came up on my page. Her comment said, this doesn't represent Christianity. The way of Jesus is one that cares about others and is concerned with protecting others. I feel sad, another, she went on to say, that this church keeps getting so much press when so many other churches are working so hard to represent Christianity well. Another thing that I saw this week was a show called The Good Place. Maybe some of you watch it. It's really funny. And I don't want to do too many spoiler alerts. But here's how The Good Place is a series opens. It's a, it's a satirical, goofy show. It opens with a woman named Eleanor discovering that she has died. And she's told that she has earned her way to The Good Place. It is explained to her that on Earth you get so many points for the good things you do. But for subtracted from that is the bad things you do. And her good things outweigh her bad things, and she has made it to the good place instead of the bad place. Now, as the series go on, you'll see that there's lots of funny nuances around all these realities. But I'll pause there. Now, I had a different example here, but I'm going to pick uh, when I first took notes on this, which was Wednesday morning. My example now changes after Wednesday afternoon. Well, Wednesday afternoon, I watched the news, just like the rest of you, in horror as we watched rioters storm the Capitol building in Washington. And on that screen in front of me, I saw as rioters pushed violently into this building, someone hold a sign that said, Jesus saves. Those are three different stories, three different incidences. And you might think, what do they have in common? They sound really different. But I want to tell you that they all have something in common. 
They all have theology in common. They all show a particular view of God, an understanding of God. Whether or not people realize it, there is theology in each of those incidences. And theology is where we're going to start today as we plan in the weeks to come to look at different ologies that shape our faith. We begin by naming why this is important. Now, let me tell you what theology means. And so we already said that theology is the study of the things of God. It comes from two Greek words, uh, logos, which is Greek for word or speech or reason. That's where that lology word comes from. And theos, which is God. So theology, the study of God. Theology has a long tradition in the church, and the word's not actually used in the Bible, but the concept is, of course, all throughout Scripture. In Matthew twenty two thirty seven, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And so that invitation to worship God with our mind is foundational for theology. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, it reads, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So again, here there's this idea, just, just a snippet from Scripture, but an overall theme reminding us that our thoughts, we want them to align with the ways of God, with how God would have us think. In Acts 17, we read a story of Paul reasoning with people of his time. He does theology with them. He's an apostle explaining the things of God. And as we continue in the New Testament, what we call the epistles or the letters are full of theology. Here's who God is. Here's how God works. Here's what worship is. And as the church began to form, Christianity came about, theology it was foundational to understanding who we were. In the early church, the questions are, well, what makes Christianity different than Judaism? Who is Jesus? What did he do? What is his nature? What is the Trinity? And all kinds of important things like that. When we get farther into history, theology questions would still be there and new ones or different eras would have different emphases. During what we call the Reformation, we see other questions come about like, who is allowed to lead a church? What does it mean to read scripture? And who should be allowed to do that? What are the sacraments? And as time goes on, other questions that have continued to grow. What is the nature of miracles? Why does God allow bad things to happen? Our, is our, our fates already predestined for us or not? Does it somehow work differently? How do Christians engage in politics? What should a Christian think about Israel? And in our time, a huge theological question has been, what counts as a biblical marriage? Theology has always been all around us. It's always had a place. You know, in the Middle Ages, theology was considered the queen of the sciences. That's a famous statement. And it wasn't because it meant that theology trumped all the other studies of science and all the other ologies of philosophy, of uh, different sciences that people could explore, biology, of chemistry. It was that the belief was, the understanding was, that the, because theology was a study of God, everything else that we studied was part of God's creation. And therefore, they all stemmed ultimately from theology. And so it made theology the highest study of all. Now, as someone who's studied theology in seminary, I assure you when you tell the average person now you study theology, they usually don't hold that view. Uh, but we might ask, is that true? Uh, those of us who do hold a high view of theology, does theology as it was understood then, as it's been understood through the ages, does it still matter? And of course, I wouldn't be doing this sermon if I didn't think it did. And let me give me some reasons that theology and studying God and thinking about how we think about God matters. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. In other words, we should be able to know why we believe what we believe. Theology offers instructions to us. It provides helpful summaries of themes of Scripture. Scripture is big and it gives us that language to understand and describe what we believe. Correct doctrine is important for our relationship with God. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
because anyone who comes to God must believe that God exists. And so there's that acknowledgement that to have a right relationship with God, we need to actually know the person that we have a relationship with. And truth is important. There is a place for truth and getting things, understanding things in a truthful way. It's one person that I read this week gave an example of imagine someone who fell off a 100 story roof and as they're falling, they yell at each floor in through the window. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Well, they may think that and they may feel that, but it doesn't make it true. We know what's about to come. And so truth does have a place in our lives. And so for all these reasons, our need to articulate our faith, our need to understand why we believe what we believe, our need to have place for truth in our life, and more that I'll talk about later, theology is important. But yet we can avoid it. And we can avoid it for lots of reasons. A lot of us can just go, you know, I believe it. God said it. That's enough for me. And sometimes it's because we're intimidated. You know, we think I haven't been to Bible college or seminary. You know, I don't know all these things that Leanne seems to know. Spoiler alert. I, I read them. I don't know all these things. I study them. Um, we are sometimes we grow complacent, right? We, we think, well, I know enough or I find this kind of boring or it doesn't interest me too much. Or we may be a little bit afraid of theology, even afraid of becoming too dogmatic or too intellectual or too, as we say, heavenly minded to be of earthly good. But as much as we might have these concerns about making space for theology in our life, we can't actually avoid theology. Theologian named Stanley Grant says, every Christian is a theologian. Theology is around us all the time. We swim in theology every minute. And I'm going to do something I haven't practiced. I'm going to try something. I'm going to simply open my Facebook page right now. And I haven't looked ahead of time. And I'm going to scroll. And I'm going to read every example of theology I see on my Facebook page in the first few scrolls. Now, admittedly, I'm friends with a lot of Christians. So actually, my first post here is from my aunt. And if it's of two little boys, and it says, this will bless you as these children praise God. Now I have an ad. The ad says, Nativity Scene Decoration, a great way to share your faith. Then I have a Tupperware ad, less theological. Next is a friend of mine who's a pastor saying, explaining why we can worship at home when we cannot worship in person. This is just me going through my Facebook page in several seconds. And then there's so many examples of people saying, I'm praying for you. Would you pray for this? sending prayers. I just hit someone asking for positive vibes for something they're going through. My friends, all of these things are theology. It's around us all the time. We use it all the time, whether or not we quite put the words to it. The question is not, do we have theology? Do we use theology? The question is, what kind of theology do you have? And as we start this series, I think it's important to name that there's many ways we can have good theology and that we can live with poor theology. And I put up a chart here to make some distinctions between those things. And I think we can see ourselves in bits of both these things. So first of all, good theology comes from scripture. And, and um, Jacob, we can go back and forth with me with this so people don't just have to stare at a chart too. Um, it comes from scripture, whereas poor theology dismisses or even ignores scripture. Theology is found, we begin by looking at what God has taught us about who God is. And scripture is one place to do that. Uh, poor theology will dismiss scripture. It will say, well, the Bible's outdated, or that doesn't really matter, or I don't like that it says that. More often, it's actually something we see in the second point from Christians, and that's that good theology uses all of scripture, whereas poor theology will only use certain voice verses selectively. Now, this is very common. Let me give you an example from the movie Footloose. Probably, maybe you've seen that movie. It's old now, but I'm sure lots of you have seen Footloose. In the movie Footloose, it's a rather ridiculous premise. There's a town where nobody is allowed to dance. They have decided that dancing goes against the things of God. Now, I shouldn't say it's that ridiculous because I grew up not being allowed to dance for that very reason. So certainly lots of people think this, but the whole town is anti-dancing and the high school wants to have a dance and it becomes church versus high school and it's a lot of drama. And at the end of the movie in the town hall, this girl gets up, the preacher's daughter, and she's like, I found it. And she reads from Psalm 150 and she reads arrogantly, praise the Lord with uh, singing and dancing. And they all go, 
oh my gosh, I didn't know that. It's the most ridiculous premise. I'm sorry, every pastor knows that Psalm 150 says, praise the Lord with dance, and she didn't just surprise the whole world. But it's this perfect example of her like, I found the perfect verse to make my point. Guys, there's the theme footloose. This is just a silly example, but there's times it gets so pervasive and dangerous. Let me use a more significant example of slavery. My friends, for generation, two verses from scripture were used to justify the sub subjugation of slaves in the Americas. And those verses were ones that said simply slaves should be subject to their master. And those verses were taken out. They were preached in black churches. They were preached uh, by slave owners to their slaves to explain this is what the Bible says about you. It says that you are meant to be slaves and you have to follow me. And they ignored the totality of scripture, the theme of scripture with the entire book of Exodus, which was about setting slaves free. The totality of scripture, which was about freedom and setting the oppressed free. Jesus who said, I'm here to set the captive free. But you see, if you take those couple little verses out, you know what you get? You get poor theology. We have to look at how they fit in the big picture. Good theology, next, will use the past and tradition. And what I mean by that is, my friends, there is nothing we are going to look at that some Christian before us in the last 2,000 years hasn't explored. There are brilliant people that have been writing and learning for centuries. There are ways that the church has done things and explored things that we learn from. And good theology will remember that, will learn from that. Poor theology will only focus on what's in the present and the future. Poor theology will simply say, well, this is how it is now. Poor theology treats people from the past as if they were somehow dumber than us or didn't have the same Bible we do. And it doesn't mean that we don't continue to learn, but it means that as we're learning, we look behind us as well as ahead of us. And we don't simply look at what's in front of us or what we think will happen in the days to come. It's not the, it's not the arrogance to say we somehow get things that all the Christians before us didn't understand. Good theology will help us interpret our experiences. Poor theology will only use our experience. It uses only experience. So let me tell you what I mean by that. What I mean by that is that when we face things in our lives, good theology will help us process them. We'll maybe going through a difficult time and our theology will help us understand what we're going through. The flip of that is to say our experiences make our theology. Now, I'm not saying that experiences don't teach us about God. Of course they do. But an example would be to say, well, I prayed for this thing and it didn't happen. So therefore, God doesn't answer prayer. One experience and I've decided my theology. It might be to say simply, I went to a church once. That church was difficult. I found that there was some, you know, um, bad happenings there. And then I gave up on church forever. Church is bad. That's your experience shaping your theology. And of course that happens naturally, but we need to then step back from that and say, but we also need to let God shape our experiences, to take the experiences and what we already know of God and let God help us understand those. Good theology acknowledges tension. And what I mean by that is that, you know what, people have, as I said, we look in the past, but people have been debating things for centuries and centuries. And good theology acknowledges that we are always learning. It acknowledges that we don't know everything. It acknowledges that sometimes what seems really obvious to someone else may look different to somebody different than them. Poor theology assumes that certainty equals truth. In other words, I feel really, really strongly about this. I feel certain, therefore it's true. Let me tell you a little story that a uh, theologian, uh, theologian I read shared this week. He told a story of a man who was dying and he had a family ring. He took the ring and pieces of it and shaped it into three rings that looked the same to leave to each of his children. On his deathbed, he gave each of his children one of the rings separately. Story says that after he died, the children spent the rest of their lives fighting about who had the real family ring. Each of them were certain and they said, my father gave me the ring. Because he gave it to me, I have the right one. And none of them realized that they each had a piece of the real ring, but none of them had it all. I love that reality of how we often feel about theology. 
theology, none of us knows everything. We can learn from one another and we need to make space for that tension. Good theology challenges cliches. Bad theology relies on cliches. And here's what I mean by that. Cliches are things like, well, everything happens for a reason. And when you don't know what to do, you just run in with that quick theology, right? God never gives us more than we can handle. Uh, God's planted another flower in his garden when someone dies. We have these quick theology cliches that we use to make things better, whereas good theology will challenge those cliches. We'll say, does that mean that if something bad happened in my life, God made that happen? We'll say, does God really kill babies to make flowers in his garden, which is a ridiculous thing that we say if we say God put a flower in his garden when a child died. That's what good theology does. Good theology can make sense to anyone. Now, the wording might be tricky, but if it is good and if it is God's truth, we should be able to find the words to make it accessible to anybody. Whereas poor theology excludes others. It becomes ununderstandable. It becomes something that we deliberately use to keep people out. And finally, of my examples, and there could be many more, good theology evolves and grows. We always make space to keep learning, to keep experiencing God in new ways. Poor theology stays stagnant. If we're struggling still with what theology is, I love Anselm of Canterbury's simple explanation. He said, theology is faith seeking understanding. Many of you watching already have faith. Theology is seeking an understanding of your faith. I've explained here what can be good and how that theology, the good ways that theology can look in the poor ways. But of course, the real question is, why does it, any of it matter? What does it matter if we speak well of God? I already said, well, you know, because there's truth and because we need to defend our faith and all those things. But I would say one of the big significant reasons is simply because theology shapes our actions. And theology should lead us to follow God better. And when theology is poor, that won't happen. And in fact, poor theology causes harm. Poor theology leads to things like the justification of slavery. I already used the example of those Bible passages, but maybe some of us don't even realize what a role theology played in the early slave trade in the Americas. In his papal bull, The Dumb Diversus, um, Pope Nicholas V, in response to uh, requests by King Alfonso, there was all these debates about like who could be taking what part of the world and this part of the world. And they were saying like, and they needed the Pope to approve these things. And so King Alfonso's king and it's in the 1400s, he's the king of Portugal. And this is literally what the papal bull, which was like a declaration the Pope would make. He said, we grant you, meaning the explorers from Portugal, by these present documents with our apostolic authority, full and free permission to invade, search out, capture and subjugate the Saracens and pagans and any other unbelievers and enemies of Christ wherever they may be and to reduce their persons into perpetual servanthood. Did you just hear that? That's the Pope using theological justification to say, we are the superior race. You're going to read and he explains that because Europe has a superior religion, superior race, you may go and whoever you find, you may subjugate. It started with bad theology. And you know what? The Crusades, the Holocaust, Jim Crow laws, Christians holding up Jesus save signs as they bombard the capital. You know what it all comes from? It comes from poor theology, poor understandings of God. And we need to not think that we are immune to that. That we're not immune to look back and say, oh my goodness, I can't believe they did that. How could they say that? We see it in our own generation. We see it all around us. And we need to be so aware of the consequences of theology that is not founded in Scripture, not founded in the whole of Scripture, doesn't look to the Christians that have taught us with wisdom in the past, only looks for our own ends and our own means, the way we want things to be, instead of starting with who God is and what we can learn about that. And it's so dangerous as a culture. But can I say that pastorally, I long for your theology to be robust because of how it impacts our lives when we face the hard things we face. And I see this all the time as people who follow Christ, that sometimes we'll face things and our theology is simply 
so shaky that we don't know, we don't have the language, we don't have the space to understand where God is because our theology is shaken. Many, many years ago, I went to visit a woman um, that I knew outside the church who uh, was a Christian. She'd gone to church her entire life. She would have considered herself a believer. And she'd just been diagnosed with cancer. She was in her late 70s. She had cancer of the eye. And she was angry. And I do not blame her for being angry. And to be clear, I think there's lots of space to be angry with God whenever you need to be. I share that often. And she was angry that she got cancer. But as we talked, her theology began to shake in. And here's why she was angry. And she said, Leanne, I do not understand. Why should I get cancer? I'm a good person. I've never really hurt anyone. There shouldn't have any big, we never really have any of these definitions of good people. Generally, it's that we haven't killed anyone. Low bar, right? So like, I haven't killed anybody. I haven't, I don't steal. She said, I don't understand why a prisoner didn't get cancer instead of me. They're the bad people, not me. They should have gotten cancer. Now again, I totally get having all those feelings. That makes a lot of sense. But she struggled with this and she carried this until her death. And what she was carrying that broke my heart was poor theology. Theology that told her that if she'd lived a good enough life, she would not face anything bad. The bad people would face that. So that when she was in her moment of deepest hurt, she didn't know how to find God in that. And the reason that we make space for theology that allows us to fully understand God is so that in moments like that, in those seasons, we can look and understand, even if we have trouble believing in those moments, even when it's hard, that we have the theology that helps us make sense of what we are going through. It may not come simply or easily, but it can be something that can be there for us when we need it. We all face questions. All of you have these questions. You have theological questions. Why do bad things happen to me? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is this pandemic still going on? What's caused this? Is God teaching us something? Is God not? When we see all these things, if we let our experiences alone shape how we see God, we will find that we don't have much of God left to lead us. But if we seek what we know of God, the fundamental truths about who God is, and let that lead and shape our experiences, we will find we can serve God with even with joy in the hardest things. So that's why I invite us over the next few weeks to make space for the study of the things of God, for all the ologies, not so that we can be smarter or nerdier or have a more ability to engage in interesting dialogue, but so we can know the God who loves us well. Speak of that God well, and so that we can be with that God well. Often in our times together, we had a series, um, a segment called Banter with Sam and Leanne. And we're bringing back the banter. We paused it for a bit, but with a twist. This series, we're going to have banter with special guests. That's pre-recorded using Zoom. And we have a number of people with theological backgrounds in our church. We have a seminary in our city. So we have a number of people who've done degrees there. And so today I have... Uh, prepared a banter time with Dr. Justin Roberts. And Justin is a graduate of McMaster Divinity College with a PhD. And we're going to talk a bit about theology. As you listen, maybe you'll learn some more about why theology can have a place. Banter time, yeah, it's banter time. Banter with Justin. Sam. So welcome, Justin. This is Justin Roberts, who is a part of Mount Hamilton Baptist Church and has an incredible background in theology. We're glad to see you, Justin. And yeah. we're going to banter a little bit today. And the question that I have for Justin is, Justin, why do you love theology? Let's start with that question. What's to love about it? God, ultimately. Um, <laughs> theology really isn't anything more than the seeking of God um, the pursuit of God in his face and so to say what do we love about it it's the God in it and it's the God in all things that shines when you start to pursue it in all its avenues and all its wonderful outlets and, and tangents but it's, it's God that I love about it 
I love that answer so much, Justin, that I feel genuinely convicted by it myself. And I need to confess to you that I personally sometimes struggle with theology. So like Justin, I went to seminary and the theology courses were not the ones I tended to veer too much towards. I like the practical courses more. And sometimes when we'd be like in the lunchroom and theology discussions would happen, I would feel like my brain was kind of slowly melding. But I realized that I do love theology. I didn't always love discussing it at a high academic level as much as some other things. But because I love God, I love theology, exactly what you said. And I love talking about God. So then that means I do love theology. That's a great way to frame it. That's and right. So why should we study it then? Why, what's the value then in digging into theology in an intentional well, way? Well, yeah. Well, it's, we become the God that we worship is why. Mm. We become the God that we worship. And when you don't, even if you don't worship a God, you become what you love you become what you worship, what you, what you aim at. And so it is a matter of life and death, of the quality of life, of, our, of the very nature of our life, what God is like. And to grow in him and the things of him and to do well by others and in our life, um, to have genuine joy that is bursting in abundance you know, in our life and beyond our life, that all has to do with what we understand God to be and who we understand God to be. Mm. Um, that's everything. So it's, there's nothing more in a way that's more relevant, you know, than that. When I hear you say that, it reminds me of like, it's good wording again, to describe what we often don't acknowledge about ourselves, which is we make mm -hmm. gods of lots of things. Mm -hmm. right? Like yes. we often say, Oh, people will say I'm not religious. And then they'll mm -hmm. talk about watching hockey, you know, 30 days straight for hours and hours. And I'm mean, just using a silly example here, but yet we do have things that we devote our lives to and our passions yeah. Uh, yeah. sometimes to the point of religiosity. Mm -hmm. um, and when we make that God, uh, we can see that that is shaping in a really important way, right? What do we actually want to be the gods of our lives? Yeah, yes. I, I see that everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. So what then should we let shape our theology? Like what are the things that are healthy for us to shape us and shape how we think of God? Where, where do we even start if we're like, okay, I want to do this well. What's, what's some good starting places? The best starting place is where God dwells within us, making his home in us in the child heart. And it's really the, the child heart. And myself having gone through a long you know, a long road of schooling and, and been in a lot of places where that child heart was not listened to 